Good evening and welcome to our evening service here at Arlington at Heritage Baptist Church. Thought you'd catch me again. i just seeing if you're listening. Just seeing if you're listening here at Heritage Baptist Church in Arlington. Good to have you with us this evening. Let's start our service with Jesus Saves. Brother Caleb, if he would open up our service with a word of prayer, please. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come here and worship you together, Lord. And I pray that you just align our hearts to be able to receive the uh, worshiping together tonight and singing and to be able to accept your message and to adapt it to our hearts, Lord. In your son's holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue our singing with trust and obey. Thank you. 
Pastor. Amen. That's good. We're glad to have you here. I'm glad to see you this evening. And I know you're excited about all the things going on out there in the world. I'm excited about what's going on in, in missions. And um, last year was a hard, hard, hard year for missionaries. And it, it seems like this year we picked up a little bit and they're able to move around and get back some. Um, the answers always come out real easy on the outside. If you had unlimited financial funds, See, now that always has puzzled me. It really has. It puzzles me in missions. Because, I'm, you know, if you say, we, if we just had enough money, then we could. But it puzzles me in politics. We can straighten out the country. If you send $300 every 15 minutes, we'll have enough. I'm trying to figure out how you do it with money. You know what I mean? And saying, how many of y'all ever wondered that? If we just had enough money, we could. And so I'm, I'm always thinking both in missions and in politics, it's way different. It's not the money. It's, it's what, there's something else behind it. And I know what it is in missions, and I have a feeling I know what it is in money. I do not think we'll ever be saved by Congress or the president or anybody else. If our country ever turns around, it'll be because of God and him doing it because his people demand it. And you say, how are they going to do it? They're, not, they're going to refuse to submit to anything but him. Okay, and I'll sh when I get to that place with you, I'll tell you where we are. Right now, that's not that way. We've become real lax as a, as a whole. And I'm praying that God will get a hold of Christians' hearts, get them dedicated back to God. We'll see a revival. And this morning, if you listen to me and I preached, I said something. I'm, I'm expecting some kind of response from that. You say, you know, preacher, I'm not doing whatever it is, tithing, giving, giving to missions, coming to the church, doing this, and reaching. Well, compared to the time, because of COVID, what were you doing before COVID? Is it, is it really COVID or you just found something else to blame it on? So uh, I, I think Christians have to suck it up, put on their big boy pants and just turn back to God. And you know what? Just do right. And so let's go. So with that, um, I want to ask you to pray about the, the missionaries we're going to show tonight. Are, it's kind of cool. I, I've known the boy since he was a kid. He is the grandson of one of our dearest members that passed away just a few years ago. This is Dobby's grandson, named after her boy. His name is Toby John, and uh, she has a boy named Toby. But this is her other son named Toby John and Goodman and his wife Sammy, and they're in Manhattan. You listening? Way out west. Montana, Manhattan, Montana. And I'm thinking downtown Manhattan there may be way different than what you're thinking. And so, but they have done a good job there. We are their sending church. And so I'd, I'd like for you to see you make you put that up on the top of your prayer list. He got there and, and he's just put both feet on the ground. You'll see a little bit of that. He made us a video to see you a little bit. He, this, he was his first video. He, he didn't do what most people do. Um, I'll have to tell you about him a little bit later, but he did a great job. He come in from the bottom, not knowing much about what church people do and how missions do and how to get into it and not a lot of support from his family that's trying to figure out, well, you want to do what? You know, said, I want to be a missionary. And uh, he, we talked about it and stayed close with him. And... Uh, he found out he had to have a home church. And he said, what, how, what does that do? I said, well, I'll show you. We'll be your home church. We'll get you registered in the missions. Come in, in. And he's been so faithful, him and Sammy both. And uh, I knew when he went out there, it would be a, a lot of work. You understand? It's this different if you're pastoring a church. You get out of college, and you're going to get you an office someplace, and you're going to have a paycheck from the day you get started. And you got retirement set up and all that, and then you're coming in. That's not what it's like, guys. He knows when he goes out there. And the reason I believe he can make it is because when he couldn't find a place to be here, he went down to East Texas, found him three Baptist churches, older Baptist churches that did not have pastors. And he pastored all three of them, and him and Sam do worked, and they homeschooled their kids, getting used to what they're going to have to do in Montana, and did it for two years. So when he left here, three churches lost their pastor. But uh, see, that, that proved to me he's, he's the kind of guy that can work there, and I think God will bless him. And you'll see the video, you'll see. there's been He didn't tell you how many people were saved. I got a letter a couple of weeks ago that 
He's had more than 30 people saved since he's been there in the summer. And he's got, it's, a, it's not what you think, though. You know, it's not like... Um, it's a little harder. than I, Part of Montana, I know, is not this part. This part's covered up with a lot of liberal ideas and philosophies. It's right next to the Capitol. That's where people go when they want to change the rest of the country uh, around them. It has a lot of drug problems. It has a lot of school issues. It has a lot of things. And so he's in the outskirts there of Bozeman. And, and I think you, you'll see it. He's, uh, he's doing a good job. Pray for him. And we'll show you the video in a little bit. If you're listening online, you know, if you'd have never, you say, I, you know, I'd like to put my money under some designated event. Okay, now our church doesn't normally ask you to do that. Because when if we, you say, I'm going to give $20 or $50 or $100 or $200 a month for this missionary. When we put it out there, he thinks it's coming from us. And if you decide next week you're going to quit, then we've never been able to quit. We have to pick up that slack and move forward, okay? So I'm not, I'd, I'd rather you just be able to put it in our missions fund and let us make sure that we have enough to constantly move it across. But if you give it for a specific purpose, we'll send it for a specific purpose, okay? And people do that, and we do it. But I want you to listen to the ladies as they play tonight, and then we're going to show you the video that they made for us. <laughs> Everybody. My name is Toby Goodman. I am a pastor here in Manhattan, Montana. My wife Sammy and I moved here with our four children in August of 2020 as missionaries. Uh, Montana is one of uh, states in the northwest part of our country that is very unreached with the gospel and with churches. Uh, we pastor at the Bridge Church in Manhattan, Montana. Manhattan is just west of Bozeman, about two hours north of Yellowstone. Uh, the church uh, group here had to basically start as a new church. Um, and so we are revitalizing it or restarting it, if you will. And Lucas is our oldest. He is 14 years old and loves sports, uh, love, uh, loves RC cars and working on any mechanical stuff. Our daughter Riley is 13 years old and she loves sports and socializing, making friends. Connor is our 10 year old son. He uh, loves sports as well and loves to just play and, roughhouse and fish and hunt or do anything he can to get dirty, uh, along with his brother Marshall, who is seven years old. Uh, those two are like best of buds and will do anything together, including fight, but have a good time doing it. And they build this snowman together uh, with a huge mustache, uh, but they loved it. And Lucas is wearing his cowboy jacket when we were cross-country skiing with the 4-H organization representing the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, and there's Riley on her skis. Uh, behind her is a frozen pond, somewhat frozen pond. It's been kind of warm this winter, uh, but it's absolutely beautiful country out here and uh, great scenery. And uh, can, you can find quietness really easy. There's uh, about a million, 1.1 million people in the whole state, a state that's just smaller than Texas by a little bit. Um, Montana also... Last year was number two in the entire country for suicide rates. So while it's beautiful up here, it is spiritually dark and depressing. Second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 44. So we bring the gospel of Jesus to bring the light. Uh, but we share his love, love of Christ, by helping our neighbors with collecting firewood for winter. Um, they Their only heating source was firewood, and they do not have enough money to buy firewood or the right equipment or vehicles so a friend of ours at church uh, asked us to help and we loaded four trucks twice full of firewood to help this family and so we also helped get with backpack gives away giveaways 
with the financial support you've been able to give us and some others, we've been able to share God's blessing with these uh, kids in the community and give away backpacks. There's Sammy saying hi. Uh, we were donated a rock climbing wall, uh, did some repairs, and it works, and we use it for outreach programs to attract people. There's Sammy delivering turkeys to our local police department. Uh, we were blessed uh, with, again, financial support to be able to buy Thanksgiving food and gave the police department uh, baskets of food for Thanksgiving. And uh, they were very happy. Uh, in fact, were crying. They were so happy. And so that was a huge blessing for them. Posted on their Facebook page. And uh, we're very thankful again. And so that's what we are here for. It's to serve God and serve others. And we work with all ages, all groups, all nationalities, all cultures, but uh, the youth um, have a high rate of suicide and we want to bring that hope of Jesus to them. We were blessed with Gabe and Camilla, who are brother and sisters from Brazil, to be our youth ministers uh, as missionaries as well. Long story there, but they are sharing the gospel with 30 kids and three gave their life to Christ that night just a week ago. And so first, uh, last week of January. And this young man has uh, just turned 13, but he was ready to uh, get baptized and uh, commit his life to Christ. And so, yes, the water was cold, but he went for it. And so we tried to warm it up, but, you know, we're Montana, so you can only do so much. But anyway, please pray for us, uh, the Goodman family, Toby, Sammy, Lucas, Riley, Connor, and Marshall. And uh, follow us at goodman.missions at gmail.com, goodman.missions with an S at gmail.com, or Goodman Missions is our Facebook page, Goodman Missions. We love you all. Thank you for your prayers and financial support. And please, please keep in touch. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Lock me up in a prison and throw away the key. Take away the vision from my eyes that now can see. Oh, deprive me of the food I eat. And even bind my hands and feet But as long as I know Jesus I can still go free Oh, that I could still go free What kind of man would reach down his hand and do this for me unworthy to live and not fit to kill the lord on the cross put me in his will and said that i could still go free now i never could quite understand why a king would want to leave his throne oh and take on the robe of an earthly man feel the pain of flesh and bone then to later tread that old lowly path that would end at dark calvary where the blood red stains broke all my chains so that I could still go free that I could still go free what kind of man would reach down his hand and do this for me oh so unworthy to live not fit to kill the Lord on the cross put me in his will and said that I could still go free go free
Get your Bibles, turn with me to the page, whatever it is in your book, but it's chapter number 7 and verse number 1 in the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 7, verse number 1. We're always grateful for technology, amen, and the way it works. Uh, then you, like, that's, if you saw that video of Toby John, that's, that's Toby John, that's just who he is, okay? He's right plant, that's what he is, you see him, you met him once, you've seen him every time. He's uh, quite a good young man. He's got a real faithful wife. My wife loves the little kid, the youngest one, the red-headed one. And Marshall's his name, yeah. And But the little kid, and he's, uh, um, he took up with Cheryl real quick, taught her how to fish, how to put a worm on the hook, how to do everything. Kind of took care of her all day long down when we went to the t- teens fishing. He showed up at his dad's place, and we wanted to fellowship a little bit and talk a little bit about where we're going and what we do. And chapter number seven is a unique chapter of the book of Second Kings. Uh, needs a little background, and I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, there's three or four really cool stories that are uh, in, in this preceding chapter. Um, one of them is that this Syrian king, Ben-Hadad, wants to take over Israel. And it's that really cool one where he, every time he gets his army together to go take care of where Israel's, God tells a uh, Elisha, where he's going to go, Elisha tells his king not to be there, and he keeps being at the wrong place all the time. And finally he asks and goes, you know, which, who's listening in my bedchamber? And he's the, one of the guys that ain't, it's not us, it's Elisha. God, his God's telling him. So they decide to go get Elisha, one of those great stories, you know, that have a lot of songs written about it. The whole army sits up out there, and, and, and Elisha's servant goes, oh, look how many of them are there are. We're outnumbered. And uh, he says, Lord, open his eyes. And he sees all the angels all around him. And Elisha says, Lord, just make them blind. And all of them are immediately blind. Poof, they're blind. Well, Elisha goes out and said, what are you looking for? He goes, we're looking for that Elisha guy. Says, ah, you're in the wrong place. I'll show you where. So he gets them all to hold hands, put down their stuff, leads them up right into the middle of King Ahab's army. And then says, Lord, open up their eyes. And they open up and they're surrounded by the other army. Well, Ahab's going to... Kill them all. And, and Elisha said, that's not what you do. These are like captives. Feed them, send them home. Well, the next year, they come back. This time they come back with a whole armies, and they besiege Samaria, the capital. And Ahab decides the only thing to do is get rid of the real enemy, the man of God. And so he determines to kill him, and he sends his Number one man down to tell him, and of course it's really cool, and Elisha says, well, you know, it's not, by this time tomorrow, if you read it, this is sort of interesting, if you, if you look out for it, that, it, that a three-fourths of a quart of dove's dung to eat, that's what, it, you know, it's like bird nest soup, okay, you don't eat the nest, but what comes out of the nest, and people all over the world still eat that, is worth about two weeks' wages, Okay, that's how scarce food is. And if you're selling, they have the price of a, of a donkey's head, if you want to eat that, how much it is. So it's really, they're starving. So he's going to go down and kill Elijah, Elisha. And Elisha tells this man, you know, that tomorrow everything's going to be selling for pennies. And of course, that's hard to believe, right? And so he said, but the good, the good news is it's going to be real cheap. The bad news is, is you're not going to taste it because you'll be dead. And so sure enough, then you come into chapter number seven and uh, you start with like a stuck in little portion of scripture. And we're, we're going to read that together and we're going to talk about these three lepers that make the, some of the greatest uh, maybe discoveries of every, every human's life. And what do you do with it? And to do the right thing or the wrong thing? And so we look at chapter number 7 in verse number 1. And he's, he's, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I just want to read down with it, okay? He, and hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And the Lord on whose hand the king answered, leaned, answered, and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. Now, 
And there were four lepers men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here till we die? Now there's a, there's a, here's a question. You see, these guys are caught in the middle. They, they can't go in the city because they're lepers. And they're outside the gate and the enemies all are out there. And that's kind of what you call between a rock and a hard place, right? All right. So they're starving too. If we say we'll enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. If we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us fall into the hand of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Assyrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host, and said one another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. They rose, fled in the twilight, left their tents and their horses and their asses in the camp as it was and fled for their life. And these lepers came to the utmost part of the camp. They went to one tent, they'd eat and drink, and carried then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it, came again and entered to another tent, carried thence also and went to hit it. And they said one to another, we do not well. This day it is a good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. And they came and called to the porter of the city and they told him saying, we come to the camp of the Syrians. And behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied and tents as they were. And of course, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story real quick. Okay, they, they didn't believe them, but they sent, they had two horses left and that they hadn't eaten. And they sent them out with the men. And sure enough, it was, and the camp was empty. And they, they chased them all the way to the Jordan Valley River. And, and um, all the stuff they threw aside because they were running for their lives. They didn't even take the, anything with them. The chariots were left, the tents were left, and all the food were left. And so all of Syria gets out, and you can read the rest of it. And Gus Ho, the behold, the king signs that assigns that number one man to open the gate. Well, you know what happens to starving people when they know food's out there? Well, they trampled him to death. He never got to eat it. And that's not really the part of scripture I want you to see right now. Uh, what, what I want you to think about with me is this. Every year, every year, we're tempted for to some to say, we've done enough. Now I want you to understand the situation with these. Lepers didn't change. They still didn't want them in the city. And they were never allowed in there. And if they got too close or didn't stay enough distance, they took care of this social distancing. They just killed them. And they went by all the rules according to a leper of the time. And yet in their heart, they said, you know, we're not doing right. Even though they hate us, we're going to tell them there's food out here. Now, I want you to, does that not apply somewhere to a Christian? We don't always fit in the world with everybody. But we have food for them. We have the gospel to teach, preach. We have the word of God to share with them. And the Bible says in the last days there will be a famine of the word of God. And I believe we're living in that. Even in our country, I'm surprised about how many people even sometimes in the ministry who do not know their Bible well enough to understand that God has a plan and it runs the same from Genesis to Revelation. Starts out that way and ends up by saying, God's still calling everybody to come. So what we look at here, it's carnal to assume that you're excluded from the commands of Christ. Every, every day, every year, we come back around to missions and every year we say, well, you know, am I going to go forward? Am I going to go backwards? And I'm going to go through. And, and it's amazing. What do you do? All right. And, and I say every, every year the same thing to you. Just pray about it. Just pray about it. And I will tell you, if you came and said, you know, I've talked to God. He said, I, give, I got to give 100% of my income for the next year. I'm going to tell you, God never told you that. I'm going to argue with you over that. I, I, I have this thing that we're always preaching about that boy with his lunch, five loaves and three fishes. It wasn't his lunch, guys. A little boy can eat a lot, but he can't eat five loaves and three fishes by himself. He's out there hawking fish sandwiches. All right? 
That's what he's doing. He's got a plane. He's got a big crowd. Where would you go to sell them to a guy? All right. And when God, he gives those or donates them or somehow in that. But God never takes everything you have for his use. Do you understand that? He does. You can offer it. And I've given offerings that are sacrificial. But God never demands that out of many of us. When Jesus saw the one woman who put in everything that she had, he made a big deal about it. Okay? And God never told him that. He's, we, it is one, one tenth is what you have, and then you, he works on above that, it's an offering to God. So in this, we, we, we assume maybe, you know, well, I've done enough. You know what I've done? I've been doing this. I've had this thing, and now I'm going to quit, and I'm going to stop. And I, I want you to think with me, uh, when is enough enough? If I compare it to what other people do, I'm, I'm way ahead. But if I compare it to what God has done for me, I'm still way behind. Okay, and the Scripture says, Why call you me Lord, Lord? Listen to this. We're carnal. We assume that we're excluded from the commands of God. Did He tell you you can quit yet? Okay, when you get a note from God saying you're now exempt from missions, let me know. I want to see who signed it. But he said, why call you me Lord, Lord? Do not the things which I say. See, you're not exempt from that. Number two, it's worldly to assume you're excluded from the commission. We talked about in our Bible study this one how broad that word commission is. An officer gets a commission. It's more than just saying, doing what you have. You've got a whole bunch of responsibility that may not even be known to you yet, but you're still under that in your commission. And so when you're talking about that, Mark chapter number four, he said, the problem with a lot of people is this, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. When the world's priorities overcome the commands and the commission of God, then we always have some problem with our faith in our service to the Lord. There's not a problem there. Now, I'm telling you right now, years ago, years ago, I had a family in the church and they had come to church. They had nothing. You ever seen those families that have nothing? They got saved. God started blessing them when they started work, living right, doing right. They got into missions. They got a lot of stuff together. Um, he was able to put some things together. She got a good job. He got a good job. And next thing you know, he owns his own business, and he's doing really, really well. And he comes to me and goes, Preacher, you know, I've got this problem. I said, what is it? Well, the problem is, you see, you know, you know, we've always tithed, and when, when we didn't make enough, you know, a lot of money, it weren't too bad. But now we're making lots of money, and I can't afford to tithe anymore. <laughs> you know, before my tithe was just a hundred dollars. Now he's, you know, one tenth his allowance. I don't think I can afford to do that. I said, well, no problem. I can fix it. And he goes, how? Let's let's get down here together. And we'll pray. And we got down on his couch. I'm probably. He said, I said, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> Now, Lord, you remember this man, and when he was a lot poorer than this, he could afford to tithe, but now that he makes all this money, he can't afford to tithe anymore, Lord. So I pray you take him back to making the sound of money he used to make. So he goes, no, 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 no. Don't pray. I'm not, Lord, I'm not doing that, okay? I said, well, maybe we could just go back to where you were. See, I found a long time ago, the people that have the hardest amount, the hardest problem with giving and doing are the people who have the most. They figure it's like the federal income tax. You know, if I can not have to pay any tax, I must not have to tithe either. You know, if you're telling me you're living in a $3 million house and you do it all on $40,000 a year, I want to see how it's done, amen? With you and your five kids, you know, I want to see how that's done. That is good use of your money. See, it's not. So he said sometimes the, the greatest hindrance to us are the blessings that came from God that we don't want to keep responsibility with God through. We want to stop. And then I want you to get this. It's fleshly to put our wants ahead of God's work. It's fleshly to put our works up in front of God's work. Now, I want you to understand, sometimes you have to think about that. Those Four lepers were out there, and they went out, and first they ate everything they wanted. Then they started carrying away gold and silver. That wouldn't be a bad thing. But then they realized, hey, this is not right. This is not just for us. We may be lepers, but we still believe in God. God 
did this for everybody. So we're, we got to go tell. You know, they put their life on the line to go tell. Can you see that? We got to talk to the king. I doubt it. Okay. See, that's not always easy to do. First Corinthians, he said this. And brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but unto carnal. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Hitherto you're not able to bear it. Are you not yet carnal? Where is there among you envy and strife and divisions? Are you not carnal? See, that's, that's, that's where we got to come back to. you got to make the same three choices every time that you make, every day when you get up, actually, but every year when it comes back to missions, as you did the first time, these guys had to make their number one. This is where we're at tonight. Do we go back to where we came from? We can go in back in the city, but we'll just die. Even if they don't kill us, they're starving in there. Do we stay where we are? If we stay where we are, we die. Or do we advance toward the enemy? And for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to deal with each one of these. Do we go back to where we came from? Do we go back to where we came from? Now, I'm a weird guy. I have to tell you that. I understand that. I have never fought God over money, and I've never fought God that His possession of my life since the time that I trusted Him. It didn't take me three years to figure out I was supposed to serve Jesus. I figured it out the night I got saved. By the time I was saved two weeks, I was working in the church. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was working there. Okay? My pastor was still pastoring there and called him. I talked to him at least once a week. And he, he had put the, this little tiny building had... When I was saved, they had these little old slat windows he put in with no windows and no inside. When I got saved there, I was first person saved in the church. Well, he had he'd put it right in the middle of what had been a cornfield. And it's, it, cornfields get a little rough, you know, when they're moving around. And he said, you know what somebody needs to do? They need to bring something over here and level off this ground. Well, that, to me, that meant, okay, I can do that. Yeah, I grew up around there, guys. I knew farmers all over the place. I showed up the next afternoon with this giant John Deere tractor with a set of 30-foot discs that folded out on the outside. And we I went over it three or four times in about 15 minutes. He was just, he didn't, he didn't know what to do about that. From then on, he was afraid to mention anything about one of them. <laughs> you know what we need here? I know somebody that'll give us one of those. You know what I mean? But we'll work on it. But when he's talked about tithing, I said, if they, this guy could tell me about Jesus... And when he told me, and I believe what he said, God did what he did, that was true. When he told me about what, how, what would happen in my life, all those things were true. Now he tells me about tithing, I'm going to do that. When he told me about missions, by the time I was in church two Sundays, I was tithing the, and giving the missions the second Sunday. I don't know anybody else that said whatever that is. I just figured if that's what you're supposed to, it's what you're supposed to do. I actually stopped him. On that time, he said, well, we, now we're going to talk to you about a missions giving. So I stopped him. I said, all right, well, I'm going to do, how many more things do I need to give to as a Christian? If this is what Christians do, what do they have to give to? Because I just want to write one check. Tell all of them to me at once. Don't give them to me one at a time. He said, well, there's other things. You know what I mean? Listen to me. I, I don't know about you guys. I found out real early that money was not the answer for my life. Growing up as a kid, I thought, boy, if I could just have money, I could just do this, I could just have this, I, boy, I'd be happy. Guess what I found out? It don't make you happy. Now, that didn't have to be very old to figure it out. What do we do? You want to go back to that? You say, but you don't understand. I, never, I was so righteous and godly when I was lost, my feet never got dirty when I walked across the ground. Somebody lied to you. Okay, if we go back to where we came from, then we go back to the world of sin. Do you remember? Maybe you got saved too early to know what it's like. Put your phones down and quit playing on, guys. Do you remember what it was like to be lost? So, well, I don't know. I was saved so early. You ought to think about what it'd be like to be lost. Do you hear the song Richard sang this morning? I was lost and undone without God and His Son when He reached down His hand for me. 
Oh, preacher, I grew up in church. You know, I know I, I have never got to do this. And I've never, I get so sick of Christians telling me, well, I never got to cheat like that. And I never got to steal like that. And I never got to do drugs like that. And I just want to figure that out. I want to be as miserable as the wine old down there in the ditch, puked all over himself. I want to be just like that at least once. I don't, I don't get that. I don't get that. I don't get that Demas thing. You can, you can walk with the man who walks with God and see God do all those miracles and go, I'm going to go to the world. There's more money there. That's what he said to Demas. He's loved this present world. He went back. You know, I don't know if he got right with God. How'd you like to know in eternity you got your name written one time in the Bible and just tell him you're going back to the world? How'd you like to have it recorded in heaven? Hey, you know what? George went back. He's back there doing all that ungodly, filthy stuff he did before he was saved. So I don't want to. When you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you done in those things which you're now ashamed? Can you, you, can you name all those things off and talk about how wonderful it was? And You ever get around a bunch of drinkers and they get to talk about how many times they puked on that night and how it was everywhere and what they did and they woke up and what? That's not fun. That's a nightmare. You want to go back to that? You want to go back to that kind of life, to the things that went with it? What kind of fruit did you have in your life then? It wasn't anything you'd be proud of. For end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, you become servants to God. You have fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. I don't want to go back. I can't imagine why any other Christian would. Most of the Christians I know really don't want to go back to the world. They just want to stay on the border line. Just enough in, the, in Christ to not act or feel lost, but just enough in the world to be real comfortable. If we go back to a world that has no peace or a place to, for us, these things I've spoken unto you, these you have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I want to overcome. The, you want to go back to that? Have you looked at the world lately? They don't like each other. They don't like each other at all. Go back and see. Well, preacher, salt is good. But if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know what countries do that betray their own country for them? When you're an American and you sell out America something and you get a lot of money from some other country that's against us, you think they're going to let you in their country? You betray yours. Why would they have you there? That's the goofiest thing I've ever seen. What do you think you're going to do? Who would want you? I've always wondered that when those men and women get together and run off with somebody else. If you're run off from the one you're supposed to be married, what, what makes you think you'd stick with them? If you're just looking for a better deal to work your way around, just keep moving. Oh, preacher, I did it for love. I know. Then if we could go back, you'd go back to a world that hates you. They hate you. They hate each other. What could be worse than you? You say, well, I have no testimony. You want to believe it? You want to bet so? All you got to do is step out of line as a Christian. And everybody and his brother remember the one time that you made some kind of public statement. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you're of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. If that was in your scripture where you read it in your Bible, and you got to read it, Jesus said that. I think you ought to know. If we go back to where we came from, then we'd go back to a backslidden Christian with no place in the world. I want you to get this. Remember what they talked to Judas? And boy, they talked to Judas. They talked to Judas. They courted him. They did all these things and they persuaded him and they did all that stuff. You say, well, you know, he was demon. But no, it wasn't. Go back. You need to read your Bible better. He let his mind go out there. Then his heart went out there. His reasoning went away. But I want you to know something. The devil never entered into him until it was at the last minute. Go back and read it at the Lord's Supper. He said, who is it that's going to betray you? And he said, the one that... And he dips it in there and gives it to Judas. And he said, what you do, do quickly. And the scripture says, and then Satan entered into him. They worked hard to get Judas. When he realized what he had done, because every time he'd seen Jesus, they tried to capture him. He just walked away. 
They tried to throw him off the mountain. He was walking in between. They sent soldiers to get him. He just walked out and they couldn't nobody do anything with him. He's thinking, this is better than Willie's bird. I can sell it a thousand times. But when he went, I think G Judas was the most puzzled. He went to the world, you know, and said, you know what, I've done something really bad. I, I betrayed innocent blood, blood. Watch what they said. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, that is, Jesus was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? We don't care. So he went and hanged himself. They had the silver. You know, they're, they're so righteous with God, they said, well, we can't use this for anything else. So we have to do something with it. We can. So they bought the potter's field. And that's what the Old Testament prophet prophesied that the 30 pieces of silver would buy the potter's field to bury the dead in. The poor dead. Judas had a party. They didn't say, well, this guy really helped us. We should. They didn't care. And the world don't care about you either. You say, well, I've got a, you know, my, the guy that sells my drugs to me, he's quit buying drugs and see what he does. If we go back, we go back as a backslidden Christian. If you don't believe so, watch what they say to you the first time you mess up in their book. They'll remind you who you are. If we go back to where we came from, we go back to being like the dog and the pig. Remember what Peter said? It's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit and the sow that, sow that was washed through the wallowing in the mire. Listen to what Peter said, warning you. When they, those people out there, speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them to live in error. You ever notice, they, you never see an alcohol commercial where they're drunk, laying down, passed out, or having car wrecks, or killing people, or anything. you always see them, they're living the high life, they're rich, they're famous, they're on yachts, it's just, you know, they have beautiful people around them, it's just, you do this, buddy, you'll be guaranteed. I want to see the real end of it. And they do the same thing with everything else. If you can just get enough money, you'll be happy. If you just get enough property, you can be happy. Guys, you, I, I don't know anybody that's happy with what they have. Some of the most miserable people I know are some of the most wealthy people I know. The problem writer said, and I'm not preaching against you being wealthy. If you'll get wealthy and stay right with God, and you tithe on it, you can stay here and give to missions. The proverb writer says that a rich man's wealth is his high wall city. He can hide behind it. But the problem is, if you're hiding behind the wall of a city, what's the difference between that and being in prison? Just a name on the outside, right? Because that's what you are. Be careful with that. For if they have escaped the pollution, oh, let's go back to that verse. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. You say, how could that be? Well, you don't lose your salvation. But everything else but that, the devil will make sure he strips it away. This morning when we were talking about the David being tempted by the devil, if you go back to Kings and read it instead of Chronicles, it says, and the Lord tested David. Well, the Lord tested him, but he backed off just a little bit. See, that's what happens. The Lord don't have to do anything to you. Satan's waiting to get to you. Your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The only hope you got is what James says. Drawn out of God, he draws, you step away from God, you're the target. When we go back to, be, to the world, we go back to being an unworthy of the work of the Lord in our life. I don't get it. And the preacher's nowhere near perfect, guys, I promise you. I'm still working at it. But I'm telling you, I, I have never woke up one day saying, 
<sighs> I'm just going to go back to no God in my life. Uh, Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now when I was a kid, I only ever plowed with a set of horses one time. And that was enough for me. It's hard enough plowing with a tractor, but plowing with a set of horses is really, really hard. Okay, I, don't, I ain't figured yet who's doing the most pulling, the horses or the guy working them, because it's tough. Now I'm telling you this. And see, in, in the puzzle in that, first time I read that I was saved, on a tractor, you look back. You set the wheel in the, in the, in the first plow row, and then you look back when you're plowing. Not when you're disking, but plowing. And he said, but when you're doing this, you've got you to keep looking forward. You, look, you don't look back. Well, one of the hard things for Christians to get is that sometimes you don't really have to do that stuff. You just have to really wish you could. Now, Preacher, I don't understand that. Are you a kid? Hey, you, you got a parent? Okay. Yeah. What if your parent came to you and said, you know what? There's days I just wish you never were here, but you can stay since you're here. Would you ever get over that, sweetheart? Me neither. I'd wonder every day if they were thinking that. What would you do? How about when your wife or husband comes and goes, you know what, I'm just tired of this. I'd really, I'm just going to try to find something better than you. But since I can, I'll just stay till I do. You know what I mean? Now come on, tell me how you'd feel. You'd fix some breakfast the next morning, right? And hope they ate it too, right? Hmm? Yeah. Do you understand God knows your heart? You, you, do you know you can hurt his feelings? You can break his heart. You can bring tears to his eyes. We'd go back to being unworthy. And we never were worthy to be saved, but he, whatever we got, we, he gave us. You ever notice some people have a tendency to say, you know, I just think I'll throw this way. They're kind of like Esau. I'll sell it. If we go back, we go back to sleep walking in spiritual darkness. You remember when you didn't know what anything was and all of a sudden you've got an insight into the world out there right now? You walk with God, He'll give you an insight into the world. If we don't do it, the time is now we wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night's far spent, the day's at hand. Let us therefore cut off the works of darkness, put off, cast off, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Did you ever notice that they don't do much riding during the daytime? Most of the really good riots are done at night. Isn't that strange? He's, and God said that's what happens in our lives. And we get away from God. And if we go back, we go back to losing the race. When I was lost, there was only one rule. There's only one rule. What's best for me? I had enough training that I did a lot of things I was supposed to do, but it was what's best for me. Do you know when I found out when I got saved that wasn't true? Paul said, Know you not that they which run in a race run all but one receive the prize? So run that you may obtain that every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. You're going to run a long distance race. You don't try to carry 40 pounds of lead in your pockets or in a backpack. You lay it aside. You're temperate. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. They get a little trophy, some money, make a few bucks. 
But we are incorruptible. You know, that's, that's the treasures we're laying up in heaven, guys. You say, well, you know, I don't believe that. Jesus said it was so. I'm going to go with Jesus on this one. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Every air boxer is a boxer is the greatest guy. Remember that story of that kid? The singer sings about, and his mom's getting ready to call him in. He's standing out in the field, and he's going to be the world's greatest batter in his eyes. And so he throws the ball up, strike one, strike two, strike three. And instead of getting discouraged, he's all hyper because he said, you know, I didn't know I could pitch that good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, guess what? When you're fighting in the air, you're the winner every time. It's a little different when the fight's real. Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I should be a castaway. Just put on the shelf is what he means. Not used. I, I don't want to go back to there. I want to hear Paul standing in front of me to hear God say it to him. I want to say it. I might be close enough to hear it. I'm not sure. But I want him to hear that. He said, I've fought a good fight and I've kept the faith. See, every, every day, every day, every week, every Sunday, every year, you have to decide, or am I just going to go back? But he said, hence up, he said, I've finished my course. I have kept the faith. See, I don't think as a Christian, you can go back and be right with God, ever. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a privilege to serve you. What a privilege to be a child of God. I think we all take it too lightly sometimes of what a wonderful tremendous opportunity we have to be saved, born again, on our way to heaven, walking in fellowship, Holy Spirit on the inside, God working on us on the outside. And Lord, we forget what a privilege that is. When we were kids, we had to grow up to see how wonderful our parents were. And I don't think we'll understand how wonderful our God is till we stand in His presence. But between now and then, Lord, I, I, I know I'm saved. I don't have to do anything. I want to make you proud of me. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to do what you'd want me to do. And I want to say every day, Lord, what would you have me to do? And mean it. And I pray, Father, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. Thank you for letting us gather here today to learn more from thy word. May we apply it to our daily lives. And may we make you happy with the way we live our lives and be with those that are sick. May they get to feeling better and may they come back to church and be with our missionaries as they tarry for you. This we pray through Christ's name. Amen. Amen.